Welcome to our online learning platform. The webinar room, dashboard, and widgets are completely customizable. You can resize, minimize, or move the windows according to your preferences at any time throughout this presentation. We have included several widgets on the dashboard below for easy access throughout the presentation. Here is a quick overview of the widgets. Media player, slides, Q&A, speaker bio, resources, help, survey, certificate. For attendees of today's webinar seeking continuing education credits, please note that in order to verify your attendance, you will be required to watch a pre-designated amount of time. The required amount of time must be completed before the certificate widget will be enabled. At the conclusion of the event, please click on the certificate widget to download your certificate of attendance. Hello and thank you very much for joining us today. I want to quickly introduce myself. My name is Rachel and I'm with HR Web Advisor and Career Learning. I'll be moderating today's presentation. All materials for today's presentation are available in the resource widget to the right of the screen. If you are having trouble opening them, please make sure your pop-up blocker is disabled. Your presenter for today is Dr. William Hazeltine. Professor William Hazeltine is a scientist, businessman, author, and philanthropist. He was a professor at Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health from 1976 to 1993, where he was founder and chair of two academic research departments, the Division of Biochemical Pharmacology and the Division of Human Retrovirology. He is well known for his pioneering work on cancer, HIV AIDS, and genomics. He has authored more than 200 manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals. Professor Hazeltine is currently Chair and President of Access Health International Incorporated. Professor Hazeltine is also frequently seen on CNN for his expertise and writes for both CNN and Scientific American. On behalf of HR Web Advisor and Career Learning, I'm happy to introduce Professor William Hazeltine for today's webinar. Professor Hazeltine, we are going to begin with questions regarding overall COVID-19 scientific updates, an issue on everyone's mind. Our first question today asks, can someone get infected with COVID-19 more than once? Uh, the answer to that question is definitely yes. Um, the way we know that is people who contract COVID for the first time have had their virus isolated and sequenced. They recovered they've either tested positive or become ill again and had the second virus recovered and sequenced and found that it's substantially different. That is very close to proof that they have been reinfected. Now, whether it's actual proof is a slight question because it could be they were initially infected with two variants and one was dominant and the other was minor. That's probably unlikely. The next question is how frequent is reinfection? And the answer is we don't know because we haven't looked. And we don't know because we haven't had very much time elapse. However, in some cases, it looks like it's up to 5% or more people who relapse. Now, the problem with knowing whether the relapse is a reinfection or a virus that is just hung on and reemerged is that it, in many of those cases, it hasn't been sequenced. I think that these are studies that have to be mounted. They're difficult studies because you have to sequence the virus originally. You have to wait. You have to retest using PCR to see if people have been reinfected or become ill again. But definitely, there are cases of reinfection. And more and more are showing up. And I suspect many more will show up as time passes. Now, if you look at the question from a slightly greater distance, coronaviruses. Coronaviruses have the propensity to infect the cold-causing coronaviruses, the same person with exactly the same strain year after year after year. There is something that the coronaviruses do that both weaken the primary immune response in many people and even the long-term response, so-called memory response. So there are now very detailed studies that show that exactly the same strain by sequence analysis has infect, infects people multiple times. One person that was studied was reinfected with the same clade of the same strain four times in six years. 
Now, if you go back even earlier to studies of coronaviruses into the 70s, there were experiments then where people were exposed, large groups were exposed to a purified strain of coronavirus, waited a year, were re-exposed and were reinfected and had the same symptoms they had before. The next question in that uh, series would be, if you are reinfected, do you get sick? And so far, we have a whole series of scenarios. People have been healthy, have been reinfected, and stay healthy. And you know that by PCR testing, that they were infected. And of course, by uh, antibody measurements. Second, you can be sick, reinfected, apparently, and be healthy. You can be healthy, reinfected, and become sick. You can be sick and be reinfected and get sick again. All four are possible. I think one of the biggest unanswered questions, I think one of the biggest unanswered questions is, does natural immunity protect? Probably not for very long for the great majority of people. Those people who are asymptomatic, those people who have mild symptoms, in some cases, detectable antibodies, that's all detectable antibodies, not just neutralizing antibodies, disappear in six to eight weeks. Now there are, I have to say, it's somewhat open issue because there are conflicting reports. The other issue that has been put on the table is what about T cells? Your body makes immune responses to this infection, which are both antibody responses and T cell responses. And whereas the antibody responses in terms of concentration of various antibodies may fade over time, the T cell responses to coronavirus's infection, and it appears to SARS-CoV-2, are much more persistent. The issue is, does that offer you any protection? It doesn't offer much protection for the cold-causing coronaviruses. We don't know if it offers protection at all for SARS-CoV-2. Those who are counting on T cells as a measure of protection are probably sadly mistaken. Unfortunately, that has gotten into the press and it's got conflated with the idea of natural herd immunity. One point I've made repeatedly in my writings is that we have to be very wary of the notion that such a thing as natural herd immunity may exist for SARS-CoV-2. It doesn't to any great extent for the other cold-causing coronaviruses. And preliminarily, it looks like it will not for SARS-CoV-2. That's different from the type of immunity that may be elicited by vaccines. And I'm happy to talk about that if people are interested. Thank you so much, Professor Hazeltine. Considering the great amount of people that you just discussed that are getting reinfected, can you tell us more about the different strains you mentioned and if there's a possibility that different blood types respond differently to the virus, given the information you shared about how T cells respond? Um, insofar as immunological recognition goes, as far as I know, at this point for SARS-CoV-2, there are no significant variants. The only variants that I know that have popped up are those that are resistant to single monoclonal antibody treatment, i.e. the Lilly treatment. They reported that their treatment of some patients with a single monoclonal antibody directed to the spike protein resulted in the detection of resistant variants. That's something that had been seen with SARS and MERS before in similar experiments. That's why uh, other companies are developing cocktails of monoclonal antibodies that don't all see the same structures. Uh, some of them are directed to different parts of the receptor binding domain. Others are directed to receptor de binding domain and other parts of the spike protein. So that uh, it is clear that this virus can mutate and can mutate fast uh, in both tissue culture and in animals and in humans. Um, but for some reason, under the conditions of natural selection in our population, and now we have great numbers of people. Now, that doesn't mean that this virus doesn't change. There was one really significant change that happened after the virus left China, and it happened somewhere in Europe, probably around early March. 
And that strain has a mutation in the spike protein that makes that virus, that strain of virus, more infectious. Actually, the biochemistry has been pretty much worked out. It allows the exterior portion of the spike to be retained in higher uh, proportion of the virus than the one without that mutation. So it has more receptor binding domains per virion particle, and that apparently makes it more infectious. And that strain has virtually taken over the world. It's displaced previous infections that were there earlier. It's a dominant strain, and it's even in China today. And you can see that it's a major strain. There are other minor strains without that mutation, and there are other clades, but they don't seem to have substantial antigenic variation. Uh, now, there was a second part of the question, if you remind me. Yes, with the different blood types, do some respond more favorably to the virus than others? Um, the, the answer is marginally. The first approximation, no. A finer analysis, slightly. But there are other factors that predispose to disease once infected, which are far more dominant than blood type. That is age, weight, pre-existing conditions that have basically any immunological defect or inflammatory uh, status or uh, underlying uh, structural weakness in the, some of the major targets of this virus being the heart and the lungs. Uh, also, people with diabetes uh, have uh, difficulty. So there are a whole series of predisposing conditions that uh, make people much more susceptible. One that I think hasn't been widely recognized are uh, autoantibodies to interferon. Uh, and uh, it turns out that with age, many people, not many, but about 0.2, 0.3% of people make autoantibodies to their own interferon. When the, it happens that that population is dramatically enriched in the hospitalized population, it's about uh, 10%, 10, 12% of the hospitalized population are found to have antibodies to the interferons. In addition, those people who inherit uh, uh, issues with interferon production are also more susceptible uh, to the serious effects of, of SARS-CoV-2 infection. We appreciate your clarification there, Professor Hazeltine. As you discuss the infectiousness of the strains, can you please explain further why natural herd immunity is different than vaccine-induced immunity? Well, the primary reason is when the virus, uh, this is a big virus uh, to begin with. It's about 30,000 units. Many of the viruses, uh, poliovirus,es are they're actually some of them called picornaviruses because they're tiny. Pico means small. Uh, tiny RNA viruses. Uh, some are 3,000, some are 10,000. But this is by far the largest of the RNA viruses. And it packs a lot of goodies along with the essential ones for replication. There are either 10 or 11 and maybe as many as 12 proteins that interfere, viral proteins, that interfere with immune responses that are known from coronaviruses in general. I have to say that with SARS-CoV-2, the territory has not been thoroughly explored by biologists, molecular biologists. It's a very fertile field for understanding how viruses interact with the human body and how this virus interacts with us in particular. But the biggest difference between a natural infection and a vaccine, there are actually, I would say two, but the first is this virus brings along with it a lot of tricks to mess around with your immune system. And I suspect, although it's not fully proven, that part of the reason that antibodies fade so rapidly in most people who are infected by SARS-CoV-2 is because the immune system has been monkeyed with by genes and proteins that the virus brings in with it. For example, there is one gene in particular uh, that is known to produce a protein that downregulates interferons, which are basically the alarm bell 
for the immune system to tell you that you've been infected. But there are many other genes that it has, so-called accessory proteins, uh, which may not be so accessory from our point of view, but uh, that modulate uh, the immune system. A vaccine has none of those. A vaccine does, is free of all the immune regulatory components because at least most of them are. Uh, even if it's a, if it's a killed virus, those, the, the genes and the proteins that are in that virus particle, the killed one, for example, that Sinovacs and other companies are developing, don't have those regulatory proteins, those accessory proteins, because they're only made once the cell is infected, at least most of them are, only made in an infected cell. They're not packaged, they're not part of the virus particle uh, itself. So that's, uh, I think that is the major difference. Either you're using something that purely stimulates the immune system and doesn't have these other regulatory uh, genes that mess up the immune system response. The other is that you make a, a different kind of immune response to most of these vaccines. Most of these vaccines are just to one protein, the S protein, the spike protein. And that means that the full force of the immune system is concentrated uh, on those. And some of the vaccines are only focusing on a small part of the S region. So it's a really focused approach. In addition, in order to make these vaccines effective, we pump up the immune response by putting in powerful adjuvants. If this vaccine hurts, and if you almost are knocked flat by the second dose of the uh, for example, uh, Pfizer vaccine, which many people are. In fact, uh, in the Moderna vaccine, some people even had the fainted a couple of days after, a uh, day after the shot and had to go to emergency, uh, for emergency care. These vaccines pop, pack a big wallop. And the reason for that is they have an adjuvant effect. And an adjuvant effect uh, is extremely powerful. Let me tell you how powerful. Animal vaccines are used with enormously powerful adjuvants. And should you inadvertently stick your finger with one of those vaccines, the inflammation reaction you can get is so bad, you could lose your finger. Now, we don't use those, of course, but we're moving up the, up the, the uh, range uh, for adjuvants, especially for older people. That has two, two effects. One, it makes sure that older people get at least some immune response because they're generally resistant. But it means they pack a big wallop, and it remains to be seen how well these vaccines are tolerated in a broad range of older people. I would say that's one of the most outstanding questions. We've already seen for the Pfizer vaccine that there was a immediate in the first day to, now they call them anaphylactoid. They're trying to be, distinguish it for anaphylaxis. Now, most of you will know that anaphylaxis can be lethal. Anaphylactoid is kind of toward it. I'm not sure what that means at this point. And if you listened yesterday to the discussion of the FDA panel, there was a lot of discussion what exactly that reaction was and why it was missed the first time. Well, one good reason it was missed the first time is people with a history of anaphylaxis were excluded from the trial. They were not excluded from the actual administration. And if you've seen some pictures of those two people, they didn't look pretty. They were swollen and blotchy. And uh, as a result, the English authorities have said, do not administer this vaccine if you don't have resuscitation capacity. Now think about what that means for the US. Does that mean you'll go to Walgreens and get your vaccine? Does it mean you'll go to CVS? or get your vaccine. You go to your local walk-in clinic and get your vaccine, maybe. But if what happened in Europe happens in the United States and you need a resuscitation capability, we're gonna re have to rethink how we administer this vaccine. That's something that's not part of the discussion at this point, but it's clearly part of the British reaction to the very first day of vaccination. Now, let me say there's another question that, that, cause, that arises, which is how many people in the United States might suffer anaphylactic events? How many people have Samter syndrome, which I happen to have, which is 3.5 million people have uh, anaphylaxis to aspirin? 
And I can tell you, I've had anaphylactic reactions. It's not pleasant. And therefore, I am not, at this point, qualified to receive the Pfizer vaccine. Broadly speaking, people with serious allergies constitute about 15% of our population. What are we going to do? What will the FDA regulations say about that? Listening to the final de debate yesterday, I'm not sure how seriously the FDA is going to take that. The vote, as you'll remember, is everybody over the age of 16. That we think this is over the age of 16. Now, let me give you a stand back and give you a little bit of analysis, my analysis of that discussion. I think deep overlying that whole discussion and the analysis was fear, fear of this pandemic. And it's a justifiable fear. It's out of control. Not only is it an exponential rise, the exponent is increasing, not decreasing. We are by far the outlier in the world in miserable control of this pandemic. We're just not doing it. And when the people who were doing, the doctors and physicians and lay people were reviewing the data, they have in mind that the day before, over 3,000 Americans died. And they, can, and they could see a time when maybe 5,000, 6,000 Americans died per day. That's pretty frightening. And so I think the committee was willing to take risks in this case, even though there are many, many unknowns. How, for example, a side effect profile. We just saw one side effect. I'm sure we're going to see others. We haven't really tested this in very many people. You know, vaccines are normally tested maybe in millions of people, not tens of thousands of people, before you're really confident of safety. Because you're looking for side effects in one in a million, certainly one in 100,000 to one in a million. That's a, a good vaccine is one in a million. And even then you get worried because if you're giving it to uh, a billion people, one in a million is a thousand people may get a a serious side effect. So you are worried and you look at cost benefit here because of the severity of the pandemic in the United States, they're willing to go ahead. That was one real thought. And I think when it comes to looking at the side effect profile um, and who's excluded and who's not excluded, they're going to wait to see what happens in unselected populations and make subsequent modifications and recommendations for use. There'll be a very, very interesting development uh, to see how that goes. Dr. Hazeltine, as you started discussing, vaccine questions are another essential piece of the conversation. So we're going to go ahead and transition to questions about vaccines. With all this new information coming out and potential vaccines, can you please discuss how manufacturing will impact the vaccine distribution? Well, let me say, first of all, manufacturing of any drug is, uh, of course, a big issue. The biggest issue is safety uh, when you manufacture. The second issue is uh, consistency and reliability. And the, th the third issue of the product itself is stability. All of those things are important. Let me point out that at least three vaccines just imploded because of manufacturing irregularities. Now, I had warned in various writings that speed has a downside, especially for manufacturing. Because when you make a drug, especially a complex biological, it's hard to scale up. What works at small scale doesn't always work at big scale. And usually it takes two or three years to work out the bugs. And then when you're finally ready to launch your product, the FDA will say, wait a minute, make it twice or three times in the same factory. We're going to inspect it. How stable is it? Is it really exactly the same? That's all gone. In fact, I read, I'm not sure it's true, that the FDA is not even planning to inspect the manufacturing facilities. To me, that's shocking. It's irregular. It's shocking. It shouldn't be. Nonetheless, when I say three vaccines imploded, why do I say that? 
over manufacturing irregularities. Well, if you read the AstraZeneca uh, report that's recently come out in Lancet, and you look at all the noise around that, what it seems to me is what happened is there was a mistake in dosing made because one plant made a slightly different formulation from the other. And the net result is some people got a half a dose and some people got a full dose for their first shot. Now, they may have backfilled and tried to patch it, but I think it was two different plants making the vaccine and the end result was slightly different. If you look at the Sanofi, which just crashed today, what happened is that they got the wrong concentration for the vaccine that they were administering to old people. And therefore, young people who do better than older people in immune response responded well to a weaker concentration they anticipated, but the older people didn't. At least that's the explanation that they're offering. That's put them all the way back to the drawing board and may knock them out altogether. And then there were issues with the Queensland University vaccine. The way they formulated their antigen is they actually used a little piece of HIV and lo and behold, HIV antibodies were found that would suggest that a person vaccinated had been infected with HIV. So those are all three issues that you really got to, it's a warning that you've got to be very, very careful with manufacturing. Now, the question I believe was actually in quantity, how much of the vaccine can be produced. And that again is a serious question. Because when you scale up, you're not always sure of what your yields are going to be. And from what I can tell, the yields or the total process is being scaled down from 200 million doses by the end of the year to 100 million doses to 40,000 doses. We'll see how many doses are actually administered. I know that people are getting their dose allotments uh, and are complaining. At best, this year, I would say by mid-January, maybe there'd be enough for 1% of the U.S. population maximum. We'll see. Dr. Heseltine, there's so much information out there in the news, on social media, and rumors. For someone who does not have a background in statistics or medicine, what is the best way to understand the truth about the vaccine? I think you listen to Dr. Fauci. Okay, that's what most people would tell you. Uh, I've worked with him for many, many years. He's got an enormous background in uh, vaccinology. Uh, he's a straight shooter. He's not afraid to tell you good news and bad news. Uh, he's optimistic, which is what you have to be in the, in this field. That's one answer. But you know, it's very it's, it's hard for people without a scientific background or medical background to understand the complexities. I understand that. And you need trusted interlocutors. And unfortunately, there's so much noise around these vaccines, you know, but I think in the end, uh, the nature of this pandemic is so severe and affects all parts of our country. And I learned something about our country early on when I was doing uh, anti-Vietnam War work. I would travel around the country and talk about the war effort and what the effects were, both to our own people and to the people of uh, Vietnam and Laos and later Cambodia. And what I found is in every community, there are people who are educated, there are people who are deeply thoughtful. Let me say, even before that, in high school, I was fortunate enough to spend a summer on something called the Odd Fellows and Rebecca's Pilgrimage for Youth. I went all over the country for a summer on a bus. And every place we stop, the local chapter of the Oddfellows and Rebecca's, think of them sort of a, as a Lions Club, would take us in sometimes to their homes. And, you know, I have, a, a, I have deep faith in the American people in their ultimate rationality. They may get flustered, they may get confused, but we're a pretty well-informed and responsible nation. And I think that will out in the long run. Uh, there will be pockets of nuttiness like they're in, in any big country. Uh, but I think in the long run, we're going to be okay in terms of 
the use of, of, of this vaccine. You know, people want to wait and see. Uh, that's my personal reaction to, to any vaccine. I'd like to see. I don't want to be the, the first. I'd rather be the hundred thousandth or the hundred millionth person getting a vaccine. But that's different people who have different thresholds. Uh, but I think eventually people will understand the value. Because after all, we all want to get back to work. We want to get back to our normal lives. And this virus is really interrupting that. And we want to, you know, we want to get our economy back. We want to get our lives back. And I think the, this vaccine seems to be a uh, good hope for that. Knowing what we know about the vaccine and the limited amount of adults it has been tested on so far, the nation is concerned about children. One of our attendees today works in a school and also has children. Can you speak to the possible timeline for safe vaccines for children and being able to reopen schools? Well, the issue of reopening schools is not just an issue of vaccine. It's an issue of how much virus is present. You know, if, when I look at the whole package of what we can do to control this pandemic, vaccines are just one part. You can't control this infection if we don't institute really good public health measures, mask wearing, social distancing, uh, restricting travel, uh, restricting presence of in, being indoors with people we don't know whether or not they're wearing masks. Uh, those are things we have to do. And the more we do those, the more effective the vaccine is going to be. It's kind of like having a few firefighters for a, a, a massive forest fire. You need a lot. So, you know, in fact, one of the things that's really interesting, and I've uh, put it on my various blogs, I uh, blog frequently for Forbes. Um, I'll do a little advertisement now. I, I've uh, published... Uh, a couple of books. One I think most people will be interested in. It's called The COVID Commentaries. And it summarizes all, it is in fact a compendium of all the things I've written, all the TV interviews I've given, all the radio announcements, I've, all the message uh, interviews I've uh, given, uh, and as well as all of the uh, lay press, scientific and medical press that has informed my opinions. So far it's 1500 pages. And it only goes through September, and we're just about to issue another version. You buy volumes one and two, and you get everything else updated for free. Uh, and, you know, you go to Amazon, you go to someplace like that to get it. But the reason I mention that is that is where there's a, a tremendous amount of information. Um, you ask me how you get this information. Well, you know, that's one way. I've written two books, one called uh, uh, A Family Guide to COVID, and the other A, back to school, a COVID Back to School Guide. Those books are seemingly simple on the surface, but every statement we make is backed up by scientific and medical papers. And so you can dig down as deeply as you want. Those are entry points to really dig down. And again, those are books, you buy one, you get all the subsequent editions for free. So it's a new format I've uh, developed called uh, uh, a living ebook. Uh, and uh, again, those are available uh, on Amazon. So I think those are interesting sources for the kind of information uh, that uh, people are looking for. Thank you again for sharing your expertise with our audience, Dr. Hazeltine. If anyone is interested in learning more about those books, we encourage you to check out the eBooks. They're available on Amazon, as he said. And we have linked the two most recent publications in the resource box to the right of your screen for easy access. Dr. Hazeltine, a frequent question coming in right now is, will the vaccine need to be updated year after year like the flu vaccine? My guess is yes, but it's a qualified yes because we don't know several things. We don't know how long this vaccine will last. Uh, now, one thing most people don't realize about the flu vaccine is that immunity does not last very long. There's a recent series of papers that suggests the actual concentrations of antibodies induced by the flu vaccines is very short, less than four months. So if you want to be protected in February, don't take the vaccine in September. That's an actual recommendation. And it doesn't have to do with something everybody knows, which is the flu virus changes from year to year. This is for the very same flu virus. That really surprised me. I thought we needed a new shot every year because the virus changed. Now, I think we need it for two reasons. Immunity doesn't last very long. And 
uh, the virus changes. Well, there's a very pesky observation about the coronaviruses that cause colds. They come back every year and affect about 15 to 30 percent of the population. They're four strains in circulation. And if you really look carefully, as, uh, for example, um, uh, has been done in recent papers in science, a very good paper uh, that analyzes various variables. How long does protection of a vaccine last? How effective is the vaccine? Um, uh, what is natural immunity like? What are the other factors in play that affect transmission, like public health measures? All of those things affect the recurrence of uh, viruses. I believe that SARS-CoV-2 is now endemic in the global population and is likely, like the flu, to come back every year. Now, we are beginning to learn something about its relative infectivity. The people I've talked to say it's the most infectious agent they've ever seen since measles. Let me give you a data point that's interesting. We all have seen the COVID-19 epidemic, pandemic in South America. What most people haven't looked at is what happened last winter to influenza. And if you do, you'd notice it was 98% reduced. 98% over the previous year. Why? Presumably because whatever measures were taken to social distance, wear masks, worked really well for flu, but because the SARS-CoV-2 virus is so much more infectious, it didn't work so well for that. So far this year, with very rare exceptions, few spots in the Southwest, there's a much milder flu epidemic this year, and the safety measures we are using do work. They just don't work very well for SARS-CoV-2 because it's so much more infectious. Now, let me point out some recent studies that show you how tricky this infection is. China has the privilege of being virtually COVID-free as a consequence of very rigorous public health measures. That is, isolating anybody who's been exposed, whether it's a whole city, a whole province, and doing it on a regular basis and not being afraid to test 5 million, 10 million people in a week if there's a new outbreak. So they're COVID-free except for exogenous introduction. So they're able to see rare events. What did they see? First of all, they see it comes in on frozen food from countries with a high rate. So we've been told, don't worry about packages. Well, it stays alive on frozen food for at least a month or two. And people who touch that frozen food infect and then infect their community. That is documented in about five or six, at least five different times. Recently, there was a cargo container that had never even been frozen, just cold. And by DNA, by RNA sequence analysis, they traced a local infection of 186 people in Kashgar to that container. So it stays alive in cold and really cold conditions for a very long time. That's against not part of what you've heard. Also, they have evidence that about 5% of people who are infected are infectious and contagious for longer than 14 days. Now, the reason they can see that is because they have no COVID and they can measure and they make people quarantine for 14 days and they still get infections. Now, as a consequence of that, they don't let anybody into their country who's not IgM positive. That means if they're IgM positive, IgM negative, I mean, if you're IgM positive, negative, you haven't been infected for about seven to nine weeks. That's how long it takes for IgM to disappear. So we're seeing and learning things from this virus, from this exceptional experiment of a country that's free, except for a virus, except for virus that comes from the outside, and they can actually quantitate. Also, you may have seen these uh, recent report that you don't really have to be next to somebody who's infectious for very long. Some people have been infected by being in the same room with somebody for five minutes. That's all.
five minutes. And how do we know that? They've actually sequenced the viruses, so they know who gave it to whom. And in that case, they know if you were facing away from the airflow, you didn't get infected. If you were facing into the airflow that was blowing behind the infected person as he came into the shop, you were infected. So we're learning a lot about how tricky this virus is. Knowing that all this information is coming in so rapidly from scientists and that we're gaining new knowledge by the hour, we know the flu vaccine has gone through long-term testing. Are there any concerns of long-term effects from the vaccine if scientists haven't had years to study these effects? Does that outweigh the safety for immunocompromised people? Is it more important for them to get the vaccine or should they wait and find more information from scientists? I don't think the vaccine is indicated for immunocompromised people at the moment. It would be my statement. I'm not sure that's what the, it would agree with the FDA. That's my personal, unsupported uh, by a lot of evidence opinion. So I take it for what, it, what it's worth. Um, we, need, we need to do, do uh, more research on that. You know, in the uh, hearing yesterday, people brought up the question of safety. And there are really serious issues of safety because actually the vaccine hasn't been tested very long. The response of the FDA, people, the, the FDA itself, and some of the panel members, but particularly FDA as well, you know, we've done a, we, we did a look back at vaccines. And that's when we put the two month period. Most serious adverse effects occur within the first five to six weeks of, uh, of uh, administration, with one or two exceptions. And so that's why we put, the two months waiting period after the last dose. But there are, of course, other possibilities. Antibody dependent enhancement would, would require infection of, an inf of a person who's vaccinated. And let me say the biggest loophole right now that I perceive in the vaccination is not actually its safety. It's actually whether memory works at all. We don't know that yet. Why don't we know that? When you give a vaccine to somebody, they make an amazing immune response. And we've seen these great immune responses. These vaccines that they're using now make really good immune responses to the antigen they put in. And then, it, because the trial has been so short, those initial antibodies created by the injection of protein into the human body have not had time to fade before people encountered the virus. So you're not measuring memory, you're measuring immediate response and that you're measuring protection by the antibodies which are induced immediately, not by the memory which may kick in only after, you, you can only measure memory after the very high levels of antibody given by the vaccine begin to subside. So we have no idea actually right now, whether memory works at all. And as far as I've seen, I haven't seen that for any of the animal studies either. I haven't seen a study that says, you know, two years ago or a year ago, we vaccinated six animals. And now we're looking at whether they're still immune. I haven't seen that data. I'd like to see the data first for animals, but it's gonna be really interesting to see uh, how long these work. Uh, for people. But with respect to long-term safety, one of the points that was raised very clearly by the review committee is it doesn't exist because it can't exist. There hasn't been enough time. So that's something we have to watch and wait. And the committee was very clear. FDA, please, and the companies were instructed, please do your long-term follow-up of your vaccinated people to make sure this thing is safe over the long term, not just the short term. Even though you think most adverse reactions occur quickly. That may not be the case. So please do phase four long-term surveillance. Dr. Hazeltine, you were just mentioning how data hasn't come out about the long-term safety. And considering the amount of people that still need to be tested to ensure better safety outcomes, how does the fact that minors cannot be vaccinated affect the outcomes of the safety trials and the vaccination? Well, you know, that reminds me, I really didn't answer the children's question. So the way that vaccines get tested in children is first you show it's safe, let's say it's efficacious, 
and most likely safe at adults. And that's done for some of these vaccines. We have to wait longer to look at long-term effects. But then you begin to go down the age range. You go from 18 to 15, from 15 to 12, from 12 to five, and then from five down. That's a long process. I don't think that children, or most children will be getting the vaccine uh, for six months, nine months, and maybe longer. There are bridging studies you can do if it's safe and effective for larger and larger numbers of people, you can be more confident. But there's another issue with children that is worth bringing up. One of the things you hope for a vaccine is herd immunity. I don't like that term. I don't like being thought of as part of a herd, but it means that so many people are protected or immune that the virus has nowhere really to go. The chance that it's going to meet an uninfected person is low. So hopefully... That's what this vaccine will do. But there are a couple of major questions. Does this vaccine do more than protect against disease, mild disease for that matter, not serious disease or death yet? We don't know that. We have hints that it will, but we don't know it. And will it prevent from primary infection and transmission? In animals, some animals, some vaccines did okay, but not. None of them did perfectly. They all had transient infections of the nasopharynx. Some of them had persistent infections of the nasopharynx, suggesting at least from the animal studies. We don't know that for humans yet. There's the hope that it will reduce transmission, but we don't know that. That's part of the issue of herd immunity. And you'll see why I'm connecting herd immunity to children in just a minute. The next issue is, of course, how long the virus lasts. Next question is what's called the r not. Not, not only intrinsic properties of the virus, but the public health response and non-pharmaceutical interventions. Everybody knows mass social distancing. And in China, that's actually wiped out the virus. So there, that can make a big difference. So those are all factors uh, for herd immunity. But very important for herd immunity is you have to have a certain number of people infected. And at least in the U.S., with the sloppy way we do public health, you need 70 to 80 percent infected. So if 20% of the people say, no, I'm not going to get this vaccine, this virus is just going to keep on coming back and back and back, unless we really tighten up public health measures, which because it's become political is so difficult to imagine it's actually going to happen in any time in the near future. That means children, which are about 25% of the population, people under the age of 18, are going to be really critical if we're going to try to get anywhere near herd immunity. Take that 20% out, 25% out, and you're below 80%. Now, remember, the children can't just go get a vaccine without parental commission, permission. So those whatever percentage of the adults are saying we're not going to be vaccinated is probably going to be reflected in the children as well. So I've answered the question in maybe a more complicated way. But first of all, it may be nine months to a year and maybe even longer before most children are approved for vaccination. Is that appropriate? I think it probably is, because reactions in children can be substantially different from those in people. The better we are confident that the vaccine is working, the better we're confident that side effects are limited, the faster that process will go. The second thing is, if we don't include children, we may never get to herd immunity. And if we don't exercise good public health measures, we may never get to herd immunity. That's vaccine-dependent herd immunity. As I've said before, I don't, my personal view, looking at coronaviruses, is that it's going to be like the flu. You're not going to get massive herd immunity. This virus is going to come back and back and back, even with a vaccine, unless we get tighter in our uh, public health behavior. Let me see, when it comes back and back and back, it is probably going to be considerably attenuated, which would be a great relief. Thank you, Dr. Hasseltin, for sharing your thoughts. We are listening to your information about the studies done on COVID and vaccines, and we would like to acknowledge the high school allied health class that is currently logged in and listening and show appreciation for that teacher. Dr. Hasseltin, what information can you share with this class and us regarding the vaccine and COVID testing. Another participant asked if you need to have a negative COVID test before you were to get the vaccine. 
Uh, let me first of all address the high school class. I'm very pleased that you're participating in this. You're getting a, uh, a view of the pros, the cons, the uncertainties, the realities. This is real life. Science isn't black and white. Science is a process. It's a process where you try to approximate what nature is doing. Nature can be really tricky, and you're really trying to uncover something about nature of the virus, uh, something that we didn't know about before, trying to use every bit of information you have. Uh, and you're going to get some things right, you're going to get some things wrong. I've written a book that's designed for you, children between the ages of 15, university students. And it's a book about my own life. It tells you what an exciting life science can be, what a great life. It's one area where one person can make a difference. I'm actually writing a book for younger kids, but the title I think you'll find interesting is called Science as a Superpower. And that's what it is. One human with their mind and their work can change the whole world. One man changed my, two, actually two men, changed my world. When I was your age, actually younger, I was a kid, polio was rampant. And we had to do pretty much what you have to do. We couldn't go in more than groups of three. We couldn't go to the movie theaters. We couldn't go to swimming pools. The only difference was polio get us in the summer, not the winter. So it screwed up our summer vacations, but good. John Enders discovered the polio virus, and I was privileged to actually work in his laboratory after he left. I got his exact desk in his facilities where polio was first isolated. And then Jonas Salk, a friend of mine, I became very friendly with Jonas Salk, brought us the vaccine and changed our entire lives. Two men, through science, through their mind, through their action, changed the entire world. That's what science and technology can do. My book is called My Lifelong Fight Against Disease. It's only available through Amazon and print on demand, but pretty soon you'll be able to get a hardback if you want. But it tells you about what a life in science really is. I've gone on to create many companies. Some of you may be interested to know I've made a lot of money and I've started a foundation of philanthropy. I've influenced government, hobnob with princesses, Princess Diana and others. It can be a great life. It's a life that opens door after door after door if you walk through that door. And it's designed to help you understand what that life can be. So I hope you pick it up, you look at it, uh, your teachers talk about it. It's a, you know, it's, it's not just my life. There are many people like me, but not many people write the books to help you make decisions about your life. Thank you so much, Dr. Hazeltine. Mm -hmm. And can you address the question of COVID testing and vaccines? Yes. If necessary yeah, one for of the things that we really testing. messed up is testing. And I think it's a, it's, it's a whole series of uh, problems. But one thing we should have had and could have had, which I find totally distressing, is a little piece of paper that you could put in some saliva or swab your nose and know in five minutes or 15 minutes whether you're infected or not. You just drop that little piece of paper in a test tube and you look to see one or two lines, one line, okay, two lines, you're contagious. That exists. They should be free and available to everybody. You should be able to do that to everybody in your family every day if you want. It's a major failure of our government, of our scientists. It's an enormous failure. And I'm not the only one saying this. Michael Minna is the one who first alerted us. What do you really want to do in an infection, in a pandemic? You want to know who's infected, who's contagious, not infected, who's contagious. And those people should stay home or should be isolated. Not everybody exposed, just those who are contagious. And this test exists and can be used. And we don't have it. You know, I have grandchildren, and I can tell you, that their mother has stood for several days because the kids may have been exposed at school or elsewhere in the cold for seven hours. And at one time had the door slammed in their face because she was too, you know, too far back in the line. And the other time they just about slammed the door. She said, no, no, I have children. So they let her in. Then the children are traumatized by the way they're being tested now. They don't want to go back. They hate that thing stuck up their nose. They scream and holler, don't take me back, don't take me back, don't test me. 
And for the little kids, it's even it's worse. They don't even know what's going on. They just know they're being tortured. Totally unnecessary and a major screw up. And it's not just the administration. It's the emphasis of our warp operation warp speed. The NIH, our whole public health apparatus, didn't get it right. We need those tests. We need them now and something that we can do. You know, Britain, on my advice partly, just ordered 2 billion of those tests. We need at least 100 million a day, maybe more. We don't need them forever because if people stay home and they're contagious, you can tamp down this infection very quickly. So this question has obviously hit a nerve with me. Uh, but it's one that I think is an important question. We can and should do testing a lot more frequently than we do. It can be very cheap, less than 50 cents, maybe even five cents a test. It should be available for free. You know, in uh, Latvia, you can just go to a vending machine and get a test. Latvia, tiny little country in the Baltics, look it up. Uh, you can just go to a vending machine and put in your money and out comes a test. So what is wrong with us? Thank you so much, Dr. Hazeltine. We know you are extremely busy and we are so grateful for you to share your time, your valuable information and your thoughts today. And I'd like to thank especially the teachers that took the trouble to have your class listen in on this. I hope it was helpful for you. Thank you, Dr. Hazeltine. On behalf of HR Web Advisor and Career Learning, we would like to thank you for attending today's event. You are now invited to participate in an online survey. We hope that you will take the time to provide your valuable feedback. We appreciate your time and input. If you have watched the required amount of minutes for your certificate of attendance, the certificate widget will now be enabled. Please click to download your certificate. If you have any questions, please email us directly at support at careerlearning.com for assistance. On behalf of our presenter, Career Learning, and HR Web Advisor, thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your day.